It's going to be very exciting, Julie. You're really going to be jealous. I don't know. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased that we've got some participants today in our monthly uh, education advocate. So if we can go ahead and get the agenda put up, that would be great. Please. Excellent. Thank you. So we've got uh, a large agenda that's in front of us, and I very much appreciate everyone's attention last week. Last week was very busy with all the interim committee meetings that we had, as well as with, uh, I had the Board of Regents, we had the State Board of Education, and of course, uh, the Board of Public Ed. So I know a lot of people were attuned to that, and I, and I want to thank you for that. So let's go ahead. Uh, Cheryl, let's just jump into CSCT discussion, if we could. Good morning, folks. Good to see all of you on this beautiful Montana Tuesday. I've got uh, Senior Manager of Centralized Services, Jay Phillips, with me as well. I thought I would just give you a brief update that went out to our school districts last week. The first one is on bridge funding. At the end of August, the amount of uh, the bridge funding that was expended was 421000 $687.78 to be exact, or 19% of the 2.2 million of bridge funding provided by the legislature. The next update on bridge funding will be on October the 1st as we get those updates at the end of each month. On the 4th of October, we'll be doing our updating webinar with our districts, uh, at 11 a.m. with Q&A sessions with them. I know that um, uh, Jay has been on calls with providers and districts this past week uh, answering questions and we continue to work uh, to ensure that that takes place. Uh, tomorrow we'll be uh, providing a interim update to Health and Human Services at 3.30 p.m. in their committee meeting. So 
Jay, anything to add to that? Good morning, everybody. Uh, no, sure. I think you, you uh, hit everything right point on. So good. We'll stand for what questions you may have of us. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Jay. And this is an ongoing discussion that we're having with um, schools, making sure that uh, budgets um, have the availability for uh, using dollars that they may have. Uh, there's also that bridge funding that's there that Cheryl also mentioned. And this is something that the OPI has never done before. So we appreciate everyone's patience as we serve in this mental health arena for schools. So any other questions on CSCT? And one of the things that I do know that um, in our education advocates, we will have a CSCT uh, part of this as well. Um, I would like to move to Mr. Kirksey. Let's go ahead and have you then discuss what's going on with our ESSER updates. And if you were uh, attuned at all to the um, um, meetings that we had yes, uh, last week that I annotated with the legislative body, uh, we're following pretty much the same format. So we'll go ahead and we'll get this information up on the screen. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I uh, just wanna take a few minutes and give you an update on where we're at in ESSER fund allocations and utilization. Um, uh, you'll uh, see a document up on the screen here in a moment uh, that will uh, show you about how many applications we have to date. There it is. And, uh, and the reason for the different colors is uh, ESSER 1 has uh, largely been budgeted and is actively being expended. And so it is in the green category because we're not receiving any new applications uh, on the ESSER 1 front. Both ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, uh, their fi the final piece of their applications uh, were due on the 1st of September. I'm actively reviewing those applications right now and making good progress through them. Uh, but that's why they're in the yellow, yellow categories because uh, we are not um, finalized. Um, and actually some schools are still applying. So we're trying to get everybody in. So, uh, and just to orient you a little bit to the, uh, to the chart that you're looking at, um, you'll see the total uh, LEA uh, allocation is in each of the, each of the, each of the columns. Uh, followed uh, directly but below that is the total budgeted. So those are uh, uh, how districts have uh, communicated they intend to use their funds. And then, uh, and then the line under that is the total funds expended to date. Um, and this is uh, this, and this is as of yesterday, so um, September twentieth. So um, where we're looking on the ESSER. Uh, SR2 front, um, we have uh, 304 applications in to date, uh, 268 of those are approved. So about 88% of our anticipated applications are approved. Um, uh, right now of the 160, uh, 160 million dollars that are allocated in SR2 uh, with 88% of the applicate of the budgets of uh, approved uh, 125, uh, 125 million uh, is budgeted. And, uh, and though these funds have been open since uh, uh, mid-May, um, uh, utilize, utilization of these funds is just starting to pick up now as, uh, as applications were due on the first, but uh, just uh, almost $16 million expended to date. Uh, with ESSER 3, uh, and you might uh, recall that there are some additional planning components that are required with ESSER 3, both the district um, ARP ESSER plan, which is, a, uh, which is an articulation of uh, schools' needs and priorities and how they plan to leverage their ESSER dollars to meet those needs. Uh, they're also required to um, have uh, a safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan. Uh, we have about 307 
of those plans in. I think we're only missing five as of this morning. So, uh, so good progress on that front. Um, we have about 253 applications that have been submitted so far on ESSER 3, and we'll continue to see that uh, number uh, come up as we move through the month. And uh, 167 of those applications are approved. So 55% of what we're anticipating is improved. Uh, so, and that tracks about right with the numbers you're seeing with a total allocation of, a, of 347 million. Uh, just uh, uh, not uh, close to half uh, has been budgeted to date by districts, which is about half of our districts have uh, submitted their budgets, and those budgets have been finalized. And because this is the newest, it also has the, um, uh, the lowest amount of dollars expended to date. So. Below that, I just wanted to give you an idea of where districts are spending their funds. Um, and I'll pick a, I'll, I'll talk you through a couple uh, categories um, and then certainly take any questions you might have. Um, but you'll see pretty consistently across ESSER 1, 2, and 3, staffing has been uh, a, uh, a significant. Um, uh, uh, a significant budget um, priority for schools. Uh, what's interesting in that staffing is the types of staffing has shifted. So in ESSER 1, uh, we saw certainly um, uh, spending on educators, but also considerable amounts budgeted towards uh, tech support um, and technology administrators and facilities and health and wellness staff. So uh, increasing uh, custodial teams, adding to um, uh, the school nurses team, uh, things like that. Uh, as, as the funds have progressed, um, we're still seeing funding in all funding requests in all of those areas. But we're seeing um, with ESSER 2, we saw more of a shift towards educators and specialists, um, uh, specifically to help um, address loss of instructional time a uh, new emphasis put on counseling supports um, uh, as, it, as it relates to um, fostering students' social and emotional um, health and well-being. And, um, and then you'll also see uh, administration because, uh, uh, as you know, um, there is a fair amount of administration that goes into managing these ESSER dollars. And so schools are, um, are using some of the funding to uh, cover their uh, on administration cost of these funds. So, uh, and I would say probably the largest uh, staffing difference in ESSER 3, uh, we continue to see emphasis on educators and paraprofessionals really for two reasons. One, to help keep class sizes small, um, and two, to help, uh, because those class sizes are small, students can more uh, adequately social distance. And so, um, so there's been a considerable effort there. We're also seeing schools uh, gearing up to implement uh, uh, strategies and evidence-based activities to address lost instructional time, such as after school and summer programming. So uh, some, a, a considerable amount of staffing dollars are, are going towards those initiatives. Um, the next thing I want, uh, want to show you, uh, talk through briefly, is the property and services. You'll notice in ESSER 1 that that was a pretty uh, low percentage of funds were actually spent on uh, property and services. And there was a little bit of renovation, a little bit of HVAC, but you'll notice supplies were really high because uh, at this point in the pandemic, schools were purchasing a lot of PPE. Um, uh, uh, a lot of custodial supplies, uh, things like that. Um, as we've moved into ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, there is much more emphasis on some of those physical property uh, improvements, uh, specifically uh, uh, replacing and upgrading HVAC systems or any sort of air handling process that is uh, that will help schools improve the quality, uh, their air quality. And so, uh, we've seen real significant uh, uptick in those sorts uh, of expenditures and, and uh, budgeting for those expenditures in the process. So 
Um, I just thought that's kind of an interesting lay of the land of where things are today, um, but uh, certainly take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm also looking uh, in a deeper dive of all of these categories um, as well. So we have, uh, we're just in that process of making sure then that we have a, a really clear understanding moving forward uh, in, a, in a much uh, narrower view of where we are at with this. So any questions you might have of Mr. Kirksey? Thanks, Jeff. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, next on our agenda, we have got, um, I believe, we have got uh, Janie Solomon. Uh, and if we wanna go ahead and share the document that Janie has supplied, that would be great as well. Yeah. There we go. Good morning, Janie. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, share some information on EANS. EANS is the money, the COVID relief money that is going out to our private uh, schools. And in Montana, our homeschool families are also considered private schools. So they have the opportunity um, to get some of these funds. Uh, on here, you can see what our total allocation was. Uh, you can see what our distribution was, um, 3 million, 256, 550. Um, what's interesting is to see the breakdown of how these funds were expended. Um, one thing about Ian's one, uh, there were two parts to it. One was reimbursement. Um, there were certain items or services that the applicants could be reimbursed for that they incurred on March 20th. 20, or March 13th of 2020 uh, to now, uh, they can put in and be reimbursed for those services. The second part is the procurement. They can ask us uh, to purchase uh, some of these services uh, and or supplies and equipment. So 28% of the applicants asked for uh, professional or technical services, a lot of tutors, of course, a lot of online uh, courses. Some of that's technical assistance uh, of how to the connectivity um, of some of this technology. 68% was for computer uh, textbook curriculum, learning supplies, cleaning supplies also comes under that. Um, I would say that the majority of our homeschool applicants and also our private schools are asking for Chromebooks or some sort of uh, technology equipment. 2% uh, was for uh, equipment greater than 5,000. Uh, we had one private school ask for a printer as they are having to print off more of their materials so that those students aren't sharing textbooks um, or various uh, pieces, and then we also had for a facility cleaner, 2%. Uh, some of EANS2 could be used for reasonable transportation costs, and we do have some that are actually renting uh, facilities so that they can have less students uh, in their classrooms and to spread that out. Um, our applications for EANS1 closed on September 10th, and starting next week, we will start the cash uh, request part of that and be able to start reimbursing uh, some of those requested expenses. EANS 2 um, is coming out. It is part of the ARPS uh, EANS uh, money. Uh, our application went in on the 9th of September. We expect to hear back on that uh, about the 30th of this month. There are two uh, big differences in EANS 2 versus EANS 1. In EANS 2, they private schools must show that they have a population of 40% of their students qualifying as low income. Uh, so that is going to be a big one that also applies to our homeschool families. Uh, we are going to be using the free and reduced uh, school meals uh, to establish that low income level. The second one is that they need to show um, that their community, in this case, their families, um, who were severely impacted by COVID. Um, there is also, there is no reimbursement in EANS 2. We can only procure going forward those services or that equipment and supplies that they are requesting. So there are going to be um, some differences. Unfortunately, we are going to have some schools um, 
that qualified for EANS 1 that may not qualify for EANS 2 going forward. Um, there's a survey that is being uh, developed and that will go out to our families and we will be using that uh, to determine who qualifies for EANS 2. Well, with that, I am open, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Janie. Any questions for Janie on a new program that we've never done before as well? Um, but very pleased that we have Janie on board to have that relationship with our non-public families as well as our non-public schools. Any questions of Janie? And just as a reminder, all of the documents that we share today will also be sent out to you with a recording of today's meeting. All right, let's go ahead and move on back to the agenda. Perfect. So uh, very pleased we have Ashley McGrath, um, who's going to share with us very preliminary uh, data on last year's summative assessments. And of course, in all of this, the schools receive this. Uh, they, they receive this, I do believe, Ash, correct me on this, at least three weeks uh, to possibly a month or so after the tests are taken at that local level. Uh, what we have to share are a little bit of what happened um, because of the COVID relation. Remember again, these tests were taken with a window from possibly March all the way through the end of the school year. So Ashley, thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent Arnson. I will share my screen if I may. Mm -hmm. All right, Perfect. can everybody see the slides here? Excellent. Um, my name is Ashley McGrath and I am the Director of Assessment here at the OPI and the content that we've prepared for the Education Advocates meeting today is the OPI preliminary math and ELA results. And so I just want to, to preface that these slides are current as of today's date and, and really provide the most up-to-date current information that we have on testing accountability and reporting. As many of you know, the COVID pandemic impacted most areas of education, including statewide assessments. But we really wanna commend all of our schools, all of our school staff for putting their students first and prioritizing the safety, health, well-being of every child last year. So we recognize that within these data, this is encapsulating a lot of those challenges, whether that was instructional circumstances, learning conditions that many of our students, families, educators, and communities experience. And so we wanna thank our education partners and advocates for doing their best to serve our students during these challenging times. So in our presentation of the results, we're gonna provide some context behind those factors as you uh, look at these data and interpret what, and try and make sense of what these uh, data points may mean. And these slides are intended to kind of highlight those key points. So we'll talk about what's different from this year and past years and some of our plans for data use. And as the process for student test taking was changed this year due to modifications and those challenges, some of these results may look very different than in years past. So just to reiterate what preliminary means in the sense um, of this presentation, that means that our office is currently in the process of matching our student test records to official enrollment records with respect to some of those student demographic details and those opportunities they had for participating in those spring statewide assessments. And those student demographic details, those are critical for reporting on those federal disaggregated student categories. So for instance, IEP status, English learner status, um, economically disadvantaged, race ethnicity, Etc. So after we have conducted all of our analysis, we will make our data finalized and we will make sure that if uh, any of the information is changed here that that um, information is made known, um, but these will be released ultimately when we release with our longitudinal data warehouse in GEMS later this fall. So just to kind of start out here and, and setting the stage for those um, who may be 
new to kind of uh, looking at assessment results. So in the context of our state, we have roughly 150 thousand students k-12 we have roughly 11,500 students per grade and we have roughly one percent of students with significant cognitive disabilities so this presentation is focusing on math and english language arts only so there are three statewide assessments um, that we've made available to you and just as a reminder for what governed the requirement uh, this past spring, so the requirement um, was under Title I Part A of the Every Student Succeeds Act. And these uh, federal requirements were essentially placed on the OPI in our schools if there was an opportunity um, to participate in statewide assessments when it was safe to do so, that that opportunity was afforded to the students. We also sought maximum flexibility allowed by the U.S. Department of Education in its test delivery so that we could support safe administration of the assessments. So when we look at all of our state assessments, this is what um, we're referencing. And on August 12th, we released a score report memo to our local education agencies or our school districts to share with them the requirements for reporting in, in um, uh, in accordance with that waiver we received in March, access to the results, instructions how to get to these data and the reports, how to support districts with their data use plans, and also resources available to them to share with families. This was sent to authorized representatives, principals, county soups, and system test coordinators. So we've created a, a one pager here to kind of highlight some of these key points when we look at the preliminary data analysis for the multi-state alternate, smarter balance, and the ACT with writing, when we talk about participation and performance in Montana. So it is a, a receipt of that waiver. One of the requirements was that making these data available for public and families to support those educational needs and processes at the local and state level. And so what we want to do within this presentation is start the conversation to address the question, what does the 2021 student assessment data tell us about some of the impacts on student achievement due to the pandemic? So I think it's important to just kind of uh, frame the assessment itself. So the, the purpose of the assessment is for the process to elicit evidence of achievement from the learner. And the primary purpose of our statewide assessments is to measure, provide, help, and advance student achievement. So these data um, are, are critical indicators within our accountability and reporting systems to advance educational equity. But in order um, for us to provide the statewide assessments this past year, we also had to offer maximum flexibilities. So we worked with our federal partners to secure this waiver. And in doing so, this essentially removes some of those accountability requirements and also maintain some of those reporting elements. So just so everybody is aware, the data will not be used for any school identification or accountability purpose, but there is a requirement at the state and local level to publicly report the percent of students not assessed and assessed disaggregated by student group. So in the context of the pandemic, we know that there were learning disruptions. There were con considerable disruptions in testing accountability and reporting as well. So as an example, students experience various learning disruptions this school year, such as reduced instructional time, limited access to internet or technology, lack of learning support, such as tutoring or after-school programming, and in some cases, prioritized content given variable or reduced schedules. And, and when we look at these uneven, uneven, unequal, unfinished, and in some cases, un uninterrupted, we see that there is difference in the opportunity to participate in statewide assessments. So some students, such as low-income families or English learners, may have been more essentially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and had fewer resources or support than their, their peers. Yeah. Another component within that one pager are test modifications. So we had to reassess the assessment system, not intending a pun there on the, the word play, and prioritize changes to the existing blueprint to meet the demands of the ever-changing educational environment. So in this regard, we had to provide a shortened 
Smarter Balance Blueprint, we had to extend our test windows to the extent practicable. We provided a new medical exemption for COVID reasons for non-participation, and we also secured the Accountability and Reporting Participation Waiver. And so this al allowed us to accommodate the needs of the schools, whether that was shifting schedules, health and safety concerns, or other outside influences. But as we think about that, modifying the test actually complicates comparisons. So experts ha have had a lot of dialogue this past year, and in some cases, these results from this past year may not be directly comparable with past years due to these outside factors. So that brings us to participation. So some students were able to take the test, while others weren't due to safety concerns, challenges with technology, or other interferences. And this means that we have differences in participation rates for districts, for schools, for student groups that are lower than they were in the past years. And a wide variety of different reasons, whether that was in-person learning, remote learning, or hybrid, this also meant they had varying access to take the statewide assessment. So when we think about these data, some student groups may be overrepresented and some may be underrepresented. So as participation rates decrease, our challenges with interpreting these results increase. So to give you a snapshot of what um, these participation rates look like across the stick six statewide assessments. If you go down to the bottom of your screen here in that, that blue coloring, you can look, look at our number of students approximately and the approximate percentage of completion. So again, uh, we had schools report to us some bias or underrepresentation of certain groups related to pandemic reasons. Um, and, and this again challenges those direct comparisons from this year with past years. And our attempt is to look at patterns of participation and proficiency in each subject, so math, reading, science, for each student group to, to better understand what opportunities were available to our students statewide. So I'm gonna start with the multi-state alternate assessment or also known as the MSA. And when we look at this assessment, this is intended for students with significant cognitive disabilities. And so this is roughly 1% of our student population. This is given in grades three through eight and grade 11. And this assessment had its test window extended to nine weeks. So it was administered in March 15th to May 14th. And the data from this assessment provide information whether the child is excelling in some areas or also may need some support. So when we look at participation rates, there was approximately 81% of test completions for this assessment. And the difference uh, between participation rates from the 21 data compared to the 2019 data is very minimal. And I really wanna celebrate the success of our students with cognitive disabilities and also our special education staff who supported the, the services and the, the needs of these students this past year. So when we look at performance, especially looking at ELA, we had minimal declines in the, the percent of students at or above proficient. But then when we look at the math compared to 19 results, we show a slight increase in the percent of students at or above proficient. So we, we do see that we had, again, with student groups, some uneven participation rates. For example, there was lower participation among Native American Indian students compared to other racial ethnic student groups. Anecdotally, the OPI was informed that Native communities were more likely to have uneven or disrupted or unequal, no opportunity or unfinished learning incomplete as a result of the steps that they had taken to combat COVID-19 community spread with tribal ordinances for school closures. So we had a lot of contact and a lot of conversations with our honor near reservation schools to support them um, with those challenges for opening um, and, and school closures over the course of last school year. But when we think about the, the student education or the special education groups, specifically students with significant cognitive disabilities, this population is more vulnerable to the pandemic due to the learning conditions required for instruction and the medical needs that many of these children have. And it's also important to note that this test is given in a one-to-one -one setting. So considerable planning, preparation, and safety protocols were implemented to ensure the health well-being and the inclusion of these students. 
So with these challenges, Montana schools, they made great efforts this past year to address the educational needs, services, and access considerations for these students. Now I'm gonna transition a little bit. Um, so the general assessment for the, the math, elite, math and ELA in grades three through eight is the Smarter Balance Assessment. And this was given over the course of 12 weeks. So we extended the test one month and we also modified the blueprint. So we permanently adjusted the blueprint where we it removed the ELA performance task and replaced it with brief rights in the computer adaptive portion. That means the average testing time was reduced by approximately two hours, and then combined math and ELA took roughly three and a half hours to complete. The approximate number of students um, who completed or participated in the assessment was 91%. And we look at ELA and math results compared to 29, we do show variable declines across the grades. Similar to the participation with the, the multi-state alternate assessment, participation across student groups was uneven. But for example, we also have to look at what do these data represent or what do these data mean? So for example, the OPI used free and reduced meal information as a proxy for the status of economically disadvantaged within the accountability and reporting system. And the process for meal applications in the pandemic changed substantially to provide students with consistent meals during these trying times. So when we talk about the percentage of students eligible for these services, it's likely much different than it was in past reporting years. Now I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit to the ACT with writing, and I'm gonna start with the proficiency levels represented here. So the ACT is delivered in partnership with the Office of Commissioner of Higher Education. There are five tests, five subtests here, and it takes the students on average three and, a half, three and a half hours to complete. This was given over four test opportunities. So no, I didn't say a window. So there was a date in, in March, or there were two dates in March, a date in April and a date in May. And we choose as uh, the OPI to administer the ACT with writing grade 11 to meet the requirement under Title I Part A of ESSA to administer for accountability purposes, the math, ELA, and science in high school. And that means we've had to establish proficiency levels for the math and ELA. Those were set in 2017. And we established that for science this year, as noted on the slide. Now looking at the actual uh, information for Proficiency here, so ACT test data and test scores, they're used for many different purpose, purposes. So students can use that to plan for their education or explore careers. Uh, high schools can use that for academic advising and counseling evaluation. Post-secondary institutions can use it for admission, course placement, or scholarships. When we look at participation this year, it was approximately 84%. Both juniors and seniors did have opportunities in the, the spring window. We also provided an opportunity for juniors who missed it during the 2020 universal waiver year, the opportunity to participate in October, the fall before. And we look at the, the math and ELA data here, we do show a slight decline for the English language arts and a more considerable decline for the, the math data compared to 2019. When we look at our, our plans for reporting, uh, currently, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of matching test records to official enrollment records from those testing snapshots. We have that new medical exemption for COVID, research, COVID reason. Therefore, we added another analysis step to statewide reporting to look for patterns of participation in each subject for each student group. So we're uh, tentatively set to release this fall uh, on or near the Montana Board of Public Education meeting in November. And in, in anticipation of that state level release, I just want to remind the audience that we've made resources and sample memos available to school districts. So school districts don't need to wait on us. They already have the data at their fingertips and they can use that um, to serve their needs locally. So that one pager on kind of the disruptions, test modifications, and opportunity differences could be a key resource to, to help uh, districts with their data. So looking forward, 
So this, this report was intended to provide some context to interpret and understand what student achievement data may or may not tell us about student learning, and when we look at what's beyond the results. So with lower, more variable participation rates, our intent is to only use these data to inform our ongoing work to improve educational outcomes for every student across the state. Assessment results are one of a number of strategies that we will use to, to support school recovery and create stronger, more equitable education systems. Alongside, alongside score report information, it's important to consider those contexts and experiences from last school year that schools and students face during these trying times. And when we think about these data, it's an end of year measure marking the end of the instructional sequence to sum up the learning over the course of the year. So a once a year data point does not necessarily provide sufficient information to improve student learning or school capacity, but more so multiple measures are needed to tell the entire story of the student's growth as a learner. So we can use these data to understand opportunity differences across students, student groups, and schools, and begin to see the overall impacts of the pandemic. But we need all of those data points to, to have a clear picture of what happened. And districts are going to be best positioned to describe these learning contexts and conditions because they directly serve these students over the past year. So, for instance, looking at opportunity to learn information, what were the number of days that they had remote learning, or what did access to internet look like, or what did block schedules look like, or accessibility to resources and instruction? Uh, were there some relevant contexts unique to the district, such as a school-wide closure for a significant period of time, or other learning disruptions? They will be the, the best position to tell those data stories. So looking forward, uh, the Every Student Succeed Act provisions will be in place for the 21-22 school year, including the annual testing requirements. Districts should plan on test administration for math and reading language arts and assume operations as usual for test delivery when safe conditions permit. So to support this, we have adopted intentionally broad test windows and published those. And we've also will continue to use the medical exemption for COVID reason for non-participation. So that summarizes the preliminary data I have to share with you and, and thank you for this time. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ashley. Any questions you might have of Ashley and more information will follow as well as these slides will be in your inbox uh, when this meeting concludes. I do wanna talk about the pilot program that we're uh, asking schools to participate in and to make sure that we run this parallel. As Ashley had said that yes, the summative test will be delivered uh, with the medical exemption with a larger, broader window as well. And it is a data point that is uh, the summative analysis, but also the pilot program that we are running parallel to this is using the uh, formative tests that come over skill-based learning uh, within the process of that. If uh, we still have opportunities for uh, more schools to sign up, so if anyone here would like to have that opportunity, uh, please reach to Ashley and we'll go ahead and um, have this uh, move forward. I believe that this is a growth model that we're looking at uh, in this pilot program. It's not added testing. It's using the tests that are already given at that um, school level closest to that student and their learning. So any questions you might have of Ashley at this point? Thank you. Um, I know our meeting has uh, gone for about 40 minutes at this point. I also want to say that, you know, we're working very diligently here. Uh, Teacher of the Year, uh, we have four uh, great opportunities at this point, coming one from Foresight, one from Arlie, one from um, Anaconda, and the other one is from Lewistown and Livingston, excuse me. And so we are really excited. We should have uh, that encumbered and letting the school itself know uh, next week. 
The other thing that flew into my box yesterday from the Department of Ed is celebration for two um, elementary schools in Montana for Blue Ribbon success. We have uh, Ridgeview Elementary in Belgrade, as well as Cascade Elementary. I've notified both principals and superintendents of uh, this celebration for being an award, uh, national award Blue Ribbon Schools for Montana. So with that, I wanna thank all of our presenters. Uh, good job, OPI team, and wanna extend a partnership uh, going out to anyone that was here. If you have any further questions, we're here to, to help serve as we move forward through this school year. So with that, if there are no other questions or opportunities to share, I thank you. Please all stay well. Blessings and thank you for putting our Montana students first. Thank you.